Yes, we can. Good morning, Professor. Good morning. So today we have a last lecture. Um, I will first start with a um, lecture uh, and we leave some organizational issues um, to the last part of uh, the lecture when I would probably ask to uh, turn off the recording. Uh, today um, I'm giving my lecture with the slides as we agreed. Um, and this is concluding lecture for uh, the course of many body theory. Um, okay, let me share my screen. Um, can you see my slides? Hello? Yes, yeah, I can. can. <laughs> Good. Okay. Um, the, as I promised, the lecture will consist of um, two parts. Um, um, it will be devoted to summary of superconductivity uh, and summary on the magnetic um, <laughs> part with a strong emphasis of um, behavior of strongly correlated electron uh, systems. Um, and uh, the last part of um, slides devoted to superconductivity will also touch um, modern development of uh, the high temperature superconductivity uh, phenomena. So um, we already discussed uh, that <coughs> uh, the uh, phenomenon um, of superconductivity uh, had been discovered by a Dutch physicist, Kamerlin Onis. Uh, now you see that all spellings are correct. And he discovered that mercury um, can um, mercury conducts electric current uh, without um, energy losses at the temperatures below 4.2 Kelvin. So then uh, it was also discovered that many other metals like niobium, aluminum, um, uh, tungsten um, uh, also superconduct. Uh, however, the temperature of superconducting uh, transition was quite low. So all these um, metals superconduct at temperatures below 23, uh, 24 kelvins. And then for um, almost 75 years, uh, there was a hunt for um, finding um, new materials which can um, superconduct at temperatures at least of liquid nitrogen, uh, which is 77 Kelvin. Um, this phenomena has enormous um, application um, uh, in medicine, in um, um, power uh, transmitting, as you see it on the slide. Um, um, many of you have seen um, this train, um, um, which uh, levitate, levitating train. Uh, I myself saw it being in South Korea. Um, in Daejeon, uh, where for uh, some world exhibition, there were train line, um, several kilometers train line um, constructed and the train is still a shuttling, but for very short distance. It's a part of the exhibition. It's maybe half a kilometer line, but this is very impressive. Um, of course, for uh, the countries who suffered from local conflicts, it's also important uh, that uh, superconducting magnets used to detonate mines. Uh, so you see that the spectrum of application of the superconducting phenomena is uh, really very broad. And uh, technologically, uh, one of the uh, important issues uh, with the superconductors, as I said, is ability to um, um, engineer cables um, uh, and therefore uh, metallicity, um, the property that um, this material uh, should be good for um, producing wires um, is very, very important. Okay, this is uh, the um, periodic table um, of uh, the elements and you see uh, that um, the blue elements, uh, the elements which are shown in blue um, um, are superconductors uh, which superconduct at ambient pressure. Uh, the temperature of superconducting transition is nevertheless pretty low and green um, shows materials which um, uh, superconduct um, at uh, 
high pressure uh, condition. Um, the white um, shows materials we do not superconduct at all, but um, it means uh, that probably uh, the pressure is not high enough because you know, uh, if you apply enormous pressure like in neutron stars to every element sooner or later will become a metal. Um, uh, or uh, there is some intrinsic obstacle for superconducting properties. I will come uh, to this uh, point uh, later. And this is about um, elementary um, uh, systems. Um, however, um, very uh, soon it was um, discovered that some alloys um, can also superconduct. Uh, people start um, with so-called binary alloys. Sometimes in literature, uh, it is referred as A15. Um, and uh, the best uh, superconducting material from the point of view binary alloys, binary mills, it consists of two elements, uh, was uh, niobium germanium alloy, which um, uh, possess superconducting transition temperature, also of the range of 24, uh, 25 uh, Kelvins. So um, uh, what do we see and what's the difference? Uh, between um, metals which superconduct and metals which don't superconduct. <coughs> this is typical plot of the resistivity. Um, um, as you see in the bottom, uh, if you see my pointer, um, uh, that uh, the resistivity uh, has a contribution for phonons. This is temperature to the fifth power. We didn't have time to discuss kinetical properties. So this actually property, um, um, is called Drew de Low. Um, it's related to uh, the inverse transport time, which actually consists of the inverse transport time associated with impurity, with electron electron interaction, with electron phonon interaction, and so on and so forth. So, uh, with the blue curve, um, like let's consider copper, which is not superconducting up to milli Kelvin range. Uh, then, for this typical metal, there is residual uh, resistivity. Uh, then there is a contribution <coughs> from electron-electron interaction, which gives a T square. Uh, we discussed it, uh, by the way, um, when uh, we considered Fermi liquid basics uh, of the Fermi liquid theory. And then there is a contribution from phonons, which is temperature to the fifth power. However, um, the metals like mercury or aluminum uh, demonstrate very interesting behavior, namely resistivity drops down um, at certain temperature and below which resistivity is equal to zero. And therefore this material uh, conduct electric current without um, energy um, losses. I like this table very much. It's a brief summary of the history of superconductivity and also shows how many Nobel prizes were given. Let's start with the Kamerlin Onnes uh, experimental discovery of superconductivity um, in uh, metallic in, in the mercury. Um, uh, the color plot blue means year of discovery, red means year of the Nobel Prize. Um, um, then there was a Meissner effect, Meissner Oxenfeld. Uh, this is the effect um, which um, is used for levitating trains. Uh, so the magnetic field does not penetrate inside of superconductor. We spent some time to discuss physics of this phenomena during one of the first lecture of uh, devoted to superconductivity. Then um, there was a London and London um, theory. Fritz and Heist London were two brothers, um, uh, which constructed a very elegant and at the same time simple theory um, based on two liquid hydrodynamics. Um, liquid containing uh, normal and superfluid component in order to derive uh, simple uh, equations describing electrodynamics of superconductors and in particular explaining uh, the Meissner effect. Then in 1915, um, the um, Ginsburg-Landau theory <coughs> of the superconductivity was proposed. Uh, that time people didn't know anything about mechanism so Landau got his Nobel Prize in 1962 and Ginsburg got a Nobel Prize in 2003. You may ask me why there are two different years. Well, because there was a different quotation. Uh, Landau got it uh, for theory of uh, phase transition for Fermi liquid. 
and Ginsburg got it um, uh, uh, together with Alexei Abrikosov um, and Anthony Leggett uh, for um, the uh, theory of superconductivity, uh, phenomenological theory of superconductivity. In 1915, isotope effect has been discovered, um, which actually demonstrated that the temperature um, of a superconducting transition is inversely proportional to the square root of the isotope mass, which actually immediately uh, resulted in um, suggestion that the microscopic mechanism of superconductivity has uh, something to do with electron phonon uh, interaction. So phonons, uh, quantum of, of lattice vibrations um, involved um, in the microscopic mechanism of superconductivity. And uh, relatively soon, uh, soon in 1957, uh, three gentlemen, Barry Cooper and Schrieffer, um, you see their pictures, um, presented a microscopic theory of superconductivity, which got um, a name of BCS theory. And this is abbreviation for Barry and Cooper and Schrieffer. And they got a Nobel Prize um, in 1972. Uh, uh, in 1962, Joseph Son um, uh, predicted uh, that uh, the, uh, there is something which is now called Josephson effect. Uh, there are um, several um, different um, versions of the Josephson effect. One is so-called DC, directed current Josephson effect, where the current, DC current, uh, runs uh, through um, uh, the contact between two superconductors without applying uh, the external voltage. It's attributed to the phase difference. So Cooper pair um, tunnels um, uh, and uh, there is a phase coherence. Um, and second effect is so-called AC, alternating current Joseph Esson effect, where applying constant uh, DC voltage uh, um, results in some AC uh, current uh, through the junction where the frequency of the current is proportional to the DC voltage applied uh, to the system. Um, in uh, 1996, um, Osher of Richardson and Lee experimentally discovered superfluidity in liquid helium-3. Uh, I remind you that liquid helium-3 um, is a fermionic system, um, contrast to liquid helium-4, which is bosonic system. And uh, therefore, uh, the mechanism of superfluidity uh, in neutral system uh, liquid helium-3 is also related to uh, the same mechanism as uh, mechanisms of superconductivity. Um, and therefore, BCS theory was successfully applied uh, to uh, these uh, systems. In 1979, a German uh, physicist, Frank Steglich, experimentally absorbed uh, superconductivity in uh, the system cerium copper 2 silicon 2. And uh, you may ask me uh, what is exciting about this discovery if the critical temperature is just 0.79 Kelvin. However, uh, this discovery is indeed uh, very important because uh, the effective mass um, in, uh, the, of the carriers in this system was uh, several hundred times uh, greater compared to the mass of electron as elementary particle. Um, these systems uh, got a name of heavy fermion compound. I will come to discussion of physics of heavy fermion compound um, in the next, um, um, uh, in the second part of uh, this lecture. And therefore, if um, you divide your typical Fermi energy of the order of one electron volt, 10,000 Kelvin by the thousand, you will get that effective uh, temperature corresponding to Fermi energy is of the order of 10 Kelvin. And therefore the critical temperature of the order of one Kelvin is just one tenth of the Fermi energy. Uh, and therefore it opens the air of high temperature superconductors because although the absolute temperature of superconducting transition um, is pretty low, but compared to the Fermi energy of the system, it's really pretty high. Uh, but then the North and Mueller, um, these two gentlemen in 1986 uh, discovered um, the new materials, which are uh, copper oxide. Um, uh, in particular, uh, they discovered tantanium uh, copper oxide, um, which um, in the first experiment um, 
had a temperature uh, of 35 uh, Kelvin. But then um, after doping this system uh, with uh, uh, different elements, oxygen or strontium, and also using um, um, different materials from the same family, like yttrium barium copper oxide, the critical temperature um, of the transition raised from material to material and reached 135 Kelvin. And you see that the Norton Mueller got a Nobel Prize um, the very next year after their discovery. This is real uh, um, beginning of the age of the high temperature uh, superconductivity. Then in 2001, um, it was discovered that magnesium, magnesium diboride, magnesium bor 2, um, uh, possessed the temperature of superconductivity of 40 Kelvin. Um, it is known uh, that this uh, system um, is well described by standard electron phonon mechanism. However, uh, uh, in this system, uh, there are several gaps because there are several pieces of the thermal surface. And uh, this is the first example of the multi-band uh, superconductivity characterized by uh, different energy gaps. Uh, in 2008, um, uh, Japanese scientist Hideo Hosono discovered superconductivity in iron-based system. This is completely different from uh, the cuprates. Um, however, the critical temperature is still below uh, the nitrogen range, so it's 57 Kelvin. Um, and um, um, However, the family is very big. Uh, from the point of view of application, um, uh, these systems are much better metals. And therefore, this is very promising um, uh, family for uh, the technological application of the high temperature superconductivity. And quite recently, uh, Mikhail Yeremets in Germany uh, discovered um, superconductivity in so-called superhydrates. This is hydrogen 3S under very high pressure. 130 uh, gigapascal with a temperature uh, which is very close to room temperature. Uh, there are several elements which now superconduct under very high pressure. And this is also a um, very uh, rapidly growing field of modern uh, condensed matter uh, physics. Um, this is once again uh, the um, 3D chart uh, of the periodic table uh, now showing uh, how big uh, are the temperatures of superconducting uh, transition in these elements are. Okay, now we are coming to the cuprate family of high temperature superconductors. Um, um, the highest uh, temperature is mercury based barium uh, cuprate oxide. You see that this is 138 um, uh, Kelvin. I think. It's a bit outdated now. Um, this system with thallium uh, has a temperature of 168. Um, um, and this is indeed a range of uh, the um, temperatures um, above uh, the temperature of liquid nitrogen. Then there are borocarbides, um, including mag magnesium diboride, uh, heavy fermion compounds. Uh, with example of cerium copper two silicon two and uranium platinum three, iron based uh, superconductors, uh, possible triplet superconductors, uh, um, and so on and so forth. So you see uh, that the big there is a big variety of uh, the superconducting system. Let me briefly remind you uh, the uh, key properties of superconductors. So the first one um, is this Mexer Meissner Oxenfeld effect. We discussed that if we take um, the material in normal state, then magnetic field perfectly penetrates into this metal at the temperatures above the critical one. But if you cool down uh, the system, that um, magnetic field um, is kicked off uh, out of superconductor um, because of uh, the current which is generated on the first surface, which can create a magnetic field which compensate uh, the magnetic field inside the superconductor. And therefore the net magnetic field is equal to uh, zero. This is the Meissner effect. And as a message, uh, we said uh, that uh, the superconductors are perfect diamagnets because the magnetic field generated inside um, perfectly compensates the outside, uh, the magnetic field, uh, the external magnetic field. Um, 
we uh, discussed uh, that the superconducting transition is the second order um, uh, transition, um, namely um, the order parameter goes um, continuously um, uh, uh, and approaches uh, the um, uh, zero value uh, achieved at critical temperature is a square root. Uh, however, uh, there are um, two types of superconductors. Uh, you discussed it on your tutorial uh, with Andre. There is a type one um, and type two uh, superconductors, um, which are uh, different by um, their behavior. We discussed that there is a Meissner effect. <coughs> so for type one superconductors, um, if you apply the magnetic field bigger than the critical one, it actually completely destroys superconductivity. And we also discussed that the destruction of superconductivity is associated uh, with a pair breaking effect. So um, the microscopic mechanism uh, of the Barry and Cooper Schrieffel theory tells us uh, that um, the Cooper pair is formed uh, by uh, two electrons, thanks to electron phonon interaction. Uh, this Cooper pair is singlet. Uh, so it consists of two electrons with opposite projection of a spin. Uh, therefore, if you apply magnetic field uh, to uh, the Cooper pair, it acts um, with the opposite sign for two different projections and it breaks Cooper pair. So for type one superconductors, um, there is one critical field and below um, for fields smaller than this critical field, the system remains in the superconducting state while for the field above the critical one, um, it transfers to the normal phase. However, uh, uh, there are uh, type two superconductors. For type one, I gave you um, examples. Type one superconductors are titanium, aluminum, mercury, uh, tin, um, lead. Um, uh, while uh, there are type two superconductors um, uh, where there exists two critical field, uh, namely um, at the critical field BC2, um, the mixed states start to be formed. Um, namely, um, there are vertices formed inside the superconductor. Uh, vertices consist of the normal core um, and uh, superconducting surrounding. Uh, the normal uh, core um, actually can sustain magnetic field. Therefore, uh, for uh, some range of magnetic field uh, between uh, fields BC1 and BC2, there is a mixed state consisting of both normal and superconducting state. The vortices form the lattice and you discussed with Andre uh, physics of vortices um, in type two superconductors. If um, uh, the field uh, becomes um, uh, bigger uh, than uh, BC2, um, um, then um, the superconductivity is destroyed. By the way, for fields smaller than BC1, um, nothing penetrates into superconductors. This is pretty the same as uh, type one. For fields between BC1 and BC2, there is a mixed state. And for fields higher than BC2, uh, the superconductivity um, is uh, completely uh, destroyed. This is how magnetization uh, behaves um, in type one and uh, type two uh, uh, superconductors. And uh, this is the lattice of um, Abrikosov uh, vortices, which is formed between fields BC1 um, and um, BC, uh, BC2. So um, we did a simple calculation based on London equations. And we have found um, by solving uh, the problem of flat boundary uh, between a normal and superconducting metals, we see that while the field remains constant, magnetic field outside the superconductors, it goes exponentially inside uh, the superconductor. This is the law which have found, which we have found by solving um, uh, the equation, um, namely this one. Um, and therefore, the typical length scale um, which describes uh, the um, uh, exponential uh, penetration of magnetic field and superconductors is called uh, the penetration penetration depth. Lambda is uh, penetration uh, depth. And we have discovered that if you increase the temperature and approach TC, uh, the penetration depth becomes uh, bigger and bigger. Um, 
And this was also uh, the uh, experimentally observed fact, uh, which was very important for uh, the uh, understanding of uh, superconductivity. Um, so we have um, uh, discussed phenomenological theory of superconductivity, uh, where it was suggested uh, that uh, there is a microscopic complex wave function um, of the condensate, um, um, which um, actually is being a complex function, um, it contains the modulus and, and the phase. Um, and the Ginzburg-Landau theory uh, applicable in the vicinity of critical temperature um, was very powerful and is very powerful theory for describing the properties. However, uh, the mechanism of uh, the high temperature superconductivity was first uh, uncovered um, in uh, the Barden Cooper Schrieffer theory um, in uh, 1957. And there were some uh, inputs to this theory, namely, as I said, uh, there was isotope effect, um, uh, which tells that the mechanism is probably related to uh, the uh, electron phone interaction. Then uh, the experimental measurement of specific heat demonstrated uh, that uh, the behavior of specific heat is exponential. Uh, so the specific heat exponentially suppressed for the temperatures below temperature superconducting transition, which means that there is a gap in the spectrum of uh, elementary um, excitation. And then uh, there was a solution of um, Cooper uh, of a two body problem uh, showing uh, the two electrons in the vicinity um, of the Fermi surface um, actually form uh, the bound state um, with um, uh, binding energy, which is um, uh, exponent uh, to the power one of minus one of the inverse coupling constant. And the pre exponent is proportional uh, to the uh, Debye uh, uh, frequency. Mm. Um, so uh, coming back uh, to uh, the um, mechanism of electron phone interaction, Froelich uh, suggested um, uh, that um, the electron moves um, in a solid in the field of positively charged iron. Uh, therefore, uh, the electrons talk uh, to the uh, lattice uh, deformation. And as a result, as we also have discussed on the lecture, um, the two electrons which uh, travel um, in the presence of light deformation uh, like to stay together. So uh, they attract, attract each other. Um, um, this um, actually, um, this is uh, how to describe uh, phonons. Unfortunately, I don't see a uh, full screen. Uh, so you quantize, um, you quantize uh, the light is, uh, sorry, question? Question or not? Can you hear me? Because I heard some noise. I don't think it was a question, Professor. I think maybe he's, he mistakenly unmuted. Yes. Okay. Okay. So this is one dimensional chain um, and how one can quantize uh, the um, lattice vibration. So this um, are, um, acoustic phonons, which you discussed in the course of electrons and phonons and solids. Um, um, but then if we add electrons uh, to the system, uh, you see that electron density is talking to uh, the uh, displacement, is coupled to the displacement, displacement is real. Uh, therefore, we have a process of phonon uh, emission and uh, phonon absorption. Um, this um, is the um, kernel of um, the interaction between electrons mediated by phonons. We derived uh, this kernels using time-dependent perturbation theory, but this is the same time uh, the green function of phonons. This is what we substitute instead of uh, the uh, wavy, um, wavy line. And then if we consider two electrons subject to electron phonon interaction, this is pictorial representation of the Feynman diagram. We see that first of all, for the energy transfer smaller than the by frequency, we have attraction, and then two electrons form um, a singlet uh, uh, pair. So this uh, animation shows actually how uh, two electrons prefer to stay together, being affected uh, the lattice vibration. And um, this actually 
also explains um, why um, the uh, superconductivity also destroyed by strong uh, vibration. Um, in particular, uh, the vibration becomes stronger um, and stronger. And uh, if the temperature is higher uh, uh, and higher, so lattice uh, move um, uh, uh, with a bigger um, amplitude. Um, and therefore, um, the pair cannot uh, remain uh, stable um, if you'll be destroyed by uh, the lattice uh, uh, lattice vibration. So um, what is uh, then was very important is uh, that uh, the temperature of superconducting transition, which is proportional uh, to the Debye frequency, actually is indeed inversely proportional to, uh, to the square root of the mass um, of the isotope. And therefore, it explained uh, the um, isotope effect experimentally um, absorbed. Um, so uh, the Cooper pair is indeed a singlet. Uh, we discussed uh, why it is so. Uh, we know that electrons um, are fermions. Uh, therefore, they are subject uh, to Pauli principle. Therefore, the global um, wave function of two electrons, uh, depending on their coordinates and spin, uh, should be anti-symmetric um, with respect to permutation of both coordinate spins. Uh, we can factorize this wave function uh, to the part which depends only on coordinate and parts which depends only on spin. And then we have two possibilities. Either coordinate for part is even function and spin part is odd or spin part is even and coordinate part is odd. But since we are writing the Schrodinger equation, um, we we know from quantum mechanics uh, that um, the ground state wave function doesn't have nodes. So the ground state wave function, um, namely the coordinate part of with it uh, must be even function. And therefore we have only possibility, the only possibility that the spin uh, part um, is anti-symmetric. Therefore, this is uh, the singlet um, uh, wave uh, function. So the Cooper pair is singlet. However, um, as I already mentioned it on my previous slides, um, there are triplet superconductivities, uh, for example, the strontium ruthenium um, oxide, um, which for many years uh, was considered um, as uh, one of the few examples of triplet superconductivity where a Cooper pair uh, is triplet and therefore uh, the coordinate part is anti-symmetric. Anti However, recent experiments uh, leads to revision of this opinion. Uh, and it looks like that uh, the question about whether ruthenium um, based material uh, is indeed triplet superconductor or not um, is uh, not yet closed. So it might be uh, that the ruthenium material is still single superconductor. And this is yet another hot topic um, uh, of the model superconductivity. Why? Uh, well, there are many reasons for that. I maybe give you my favorite one. I was mentioning several times the quantum computer uh, and the quantum computer needs a possibility to operate um, uh, with a quantum bit, with qubit. Um, and uh, therefore, um, uh, it's very important to have a spin degrees of freedom um, active. Uh, the field um, of uh, quantum computing uh, based on uh, devices involving spin degrees of freedom is called spintronics. Um, similar to electronics devices uh, based on um, electron, uh, electron degrees of freedom, charge degrees of freedom. <coughs> and therefore this uh, triplet um, superconductors can also be useful uh, for uh, the quantum computing purposes. Um, uh, uh, this is a quick revision of uh, the uh, BCS theory. I presented you different um, methods to um, uh, describe um, and construct uh, the BCS theory of superconductivity, but in the original paper, Schrieffer constructed the wave function acting on the ground state. So you see that there are uh, operators uh, corresponding to creation uh, and annihilation of a Cooper pair, then this wave function, which uh, is written on the right-hand side, is a variational green function. It contains uh, the U and V coefficient, and uh, Schrieffer 
uh, used um, this variational, uh, variational wave function in order to optimize it uh, such a way uh, that it um, results um, in the highest possible uh, superconducting transition. And therefore he found, uh, uh, well, he actually, maybe it's not very correct. He uh, used this uh, wave function um, in order to uh, minimize um, uh, the energy um, of um, your um, ground state, which now uh, um, uh, contains uh, superconducting pairs. Um, and therefore by minimizing energy, um, um, there was found equations uh, for U and V coefficients. And from this U and V coefficient, <coughs> one obtains the microscopic equation for the gap. So Delta is uh, the gap. And this is the BCS equation, uh, which also um, has a solution saying uh, that both gap and the temperature of superconducting transition is on one hand is directly proportional uh, to uh, the Debye frequency and therefore inversely proportional to the square root of uh, the mass of the ion. And then it contains exponent and the argument of the exponent contains the effective strengths of the electron photon interaction, the effective and the density of states um, at the Fermi level. So it contains microscopic properties of given material. And actually it also gives uh, a direction which materials to um, use um, uh, in order to get highest possible temperature of superconducting transition. Because it's clear from here that the stronger electron photon interaction is, the bigger high temperature of superconducting uh, transition uh, is. However, uh, you see uh, that basically from this equation, one can never obtain um, the temperature and superconducting transition higher uh, than uh, Debye uh, frequency. Therefore, it also opened a direction uh, of uh, the research based on non-phonon mechanism of um, superconducting transitions. So the best possible way would be to find the mechanism, for example, where instead of Debye frequency, which is of the order of few hundred Kelvin, it could be the uh, Fermi energy. This is the dream. And if this is a Fermi energy, say 10,000 or 100,000 Kelvin, then even for a weak, relatively weak, uh, um, effective interaction, uh, the high enough temperature of superconducting transition uh, can be achieved. Um, um, we diagonalize um, our Hamiltonian um, using um, uh, Bogolyub of transformation um, and following uh, the seminal work of Bardian, Cooper, and Schaefer, we have found uh, that uh, the energy spectrum um, uh, of new uh, fermions, we are still talking about fermions, is gapped. So the same time uh, this parameter delta, which was introduced before, is uh, directly related to the gap in the spectrum of uh, the uh, elementary excitations. We consider the simplest model where the gap um, is isotropic um, and constant on the whole Fermi surface. However, uh, there might be uh, various possibilities. In particular, uh, the gap uh, can um, change sign. For example, you remember uh, that uh, through the Ginsburg-Landau theory, the gap is related to the wave function of the condensate. And this is precisely what happens in high temperature superconductors. I will come uh, to this point a bit later. Um, so then um, uh, with Andre, uh, you discussed the density of states. Um, and um, here it's misprint. Uh, there should be square root, uh, one over square root, sorry. Um, so the density of states um, of the, um, new carriers uh, shows uh, that there is a gap at the Fermi level. So there are no states in the band between minus delta and delta, and there is one over square root uh, singularity um, uh, of, of, the, of the density of states. And um, indeed, it was very consistent uh, with experiment um, on tunnel current. Uh, when you take, say, normal um, uh, uh, metal and superconductor put, um, make a tunnel contact, connect uh, this uh, system to the battery. And you see that by applying uh, DC uh, voltage, uh, the current doesn't follow uh, Ohm's law. Uh, 
um, at low voltages, uh, namely the current is not proportional to the voltage as we used to uh, have um, in uh, the conventional metals. Uh, other way around, um, there is a critical voltage um, for and for voltages smaller than the critical one, there is no current at all. And it explains that if you take um, say this superconductor with a gap in the contact with the normal metals, one needs to overcome gap if we are at zero temperature. And therefore one needs to shift chemical potential and voltage is precisely what shifts chemical potential um, of uh, normal and superconducting metals uh, that you fit uh, the um, edge of uh, conduction uh, band for uh, the superconductors, let me say it that way, with a Fermi level of normal metal, and then uh, the current uh, can run. So indeed, uh, this uh, tunnel density of states, density of states um, uh, was correct to explain uh, the experiments uh, with, uh, with the tunnel uh, current. And uh, this is how the spectrum looks like. Um, we said that uh, without attraction, uh, we just have electrons and holes um, with um, electron phonon interaction uh, leading to attraction on uh, the gap is formed. Um, you see uh, that at the Fermi surface uh, where um, uh, the energy of quasi particles uh, without attraction was precisely equal to zero. Now um, there is a gap and there is electron like and hole like branch. And actually this U and V coefficients um, they describe um, uh, the mixture of electron and hole-like excitations. Namely, if you go along this direction, the coefficient u uh, goes one and we have uh, uh, almost electron-like excitation. If we go along that direction uh, deeply, we have almost um, hole-like excitations. However, in the vicinity of the Fermi surface, we have almost equal mixture of electron and hole. Um, excitations. Um, uh, then uh, this equation for the gap um, can be considered at finite temperature, in particular um, at uh, the temperature close to the temperature of superconducting transition Tc. Um, and uh, then um, uh, the ratio of two delta and uh, Tc uh, was found to be just a constant, which doesn't depend on anything. Uh, because the Debye frequency staying in front of the exponent cancels out. And this is another hallmark for the BCS theory based on electron phonon interaction. So the ratio of two delta to Tc is fundamental constant, which doesn't depend on anything. Therefore, when new materials appear um, and new system are discovered, the first question which experimental ask, what is the ratio of two delta over Tc? Um, people say that this is three point something, and then people say, okay, um, it's rather a system described by electron phonon interaction, or at least BCS mechanism of superconductivity um, is um, behind uh, the microscopic mechanism um, um, of uh, superconductivity. Um, uh, however, when this high temperature superconductivity was discovered, it was also found that the ratio of two delta over Tc strongly deviates. It's four, five, six um, uh, from the value 3.5. Um, and therefore it was clear from very beginning uh, that uh, the high temperature superconductivity is not described by the BCS mechanism. It is highly likely that um, uh, the mechanism of this superconductivity has nothing to do with electron phonon interaction. Uh, okay. Um, this I already said that Cooper pair is uh, the singlet and this is called S wave symmetry. Uh, therefore, if we um, just consider a cartoon of um, spherical Fermi surface, uh, then uh, the gap is constant and isotropic on the whole uh, Fermi surface. In the literature, it referred to S wave gap and the terminology comes from atomic physics. Um, um, you know that atomic physics of um, S shell of the hydrogen atom um, is isotropic. Um, if you add more and more electrons um, and consider elements um, um, higher in the periodic table of elementary system, like you take a lithium, lithium um, has um, the second shell uh, 
uh, which um, can accommodate two electrons and there is a p shell um, the orbital number um, l um, is equal to um, uh, one um, and having orbital um, uh, number equal to one uh, the p state has a wave function which contains nodes and so on and so forth for uh, the d shell where orbital uh, number l is equal to two uh, there are uh, several nodes, four nodes, and so on and so forth. So this is a classification of uh, the uh, symmetries of the energy energy uh, gap. Uh, this is probably um, uh, a bit more complicated slide than before. Um, it refers to some anomalous averaging. Uh, as I said, we introduced the Cooper pair. And in principle, we can introduce some average of two creation and two annihilation apparatus. Um, and this is so-called anomalous averaging or um, um, Bogolubov anomalous averaging. And one can construct uh, the theory of superconductivity uh, based on uh, this uh, uh, anomalous averaging. But of course, one needs to understand um, it such a way that to the right, you have a system with n plus two electron and to the left, you have system with n electrons. Uh, so the left and right brackets are um, non-equivalent and therefore in literature, it's sometimes called uh, quasi, quasi averaging. Um, then there is a very important um, issue which I didn't have time uh, to address um, is what happens uh, in fact, if we take into account Coulomb interaction um, in uh, the system. Um, and we know that Coulomb interaction um, results in repulsion. And uh, therefore, uh, the um, electron phonon interaction, um, which is attractive um, at the narrow uh, region in the vicinity of Fermi surface, uh, should be combined with, in general, a uh, repulsive interaction um, uh, um, associated with the Coulomb. Um, uh, Coulomb interaction. Um, this mechanism uh, of simultaneous considering Coulomb uh, and electrophone interaction is typically referred as moral Anderson. So Philip Anderson um, uh, was one of the great uh, scientists contributed to many um, uh, domains of modern condensed matter theory, superconductivity, physics of disordered systems, and so on and so forth. Um, Phil passed away uh, last year in the age of 96 years, uh, being, as I said, one of the greatest condensed matter uh, theorists of 20th century. So the mechanism of Moral and Anderson actually says uh, that um, if we uh, see uh, the hierarchy of energies, um, we say that electron phonon interaction, so this is energy exists, um, is um, squeezed um, in the stripe of the width of omega Debye frequency, while the Coulomb interaction is acting in the stripe of the um, order of the bandwidth of the Fermi energy. And therefore the combination of these two energy scale leads to the renormalization of the gap equations. But um, to say it in a very simplistic uh, way, um, I would say that this combination, of course, lead uh, to the effect that Coulomb uh, interaction suppresses uh, the superconductivity. However, if uh, the Fermi energy is uh, large enough, um, uh, then uh, this uh, suppression is not crucial um, and the superconductivity still uh, survives. However, uh, this is, by the way, um, how uh, the moral uh, Anderson mechanism uh, renormalize the effective dimensional electron phonon coupling. Remember, uh, I recall that lambda is a product of the strength of interaction times the density of states. Uh, this uh, renormalized coupling constant mu uh, contains the logarithm, and this logarithm um, uh, uh, contains the bandwidth of Fermi energy and Debye frequency. As I said, if the bandwidth is sufficiently large and the by frequency is sufficiently small, then the logarithm is right and mu star goes to zero. Uh, however, you see uh, that if mu star becomes of the order of lambda, uh, then uh, the mm, Coulomb interaction uh, completely destroys the superconducting state. And this um, explains uh, why not all uh, metals are superconducting. Now let me come uh, to discussion of uh, the um, new mechanisms um, and new theories for um, 
uh, high temperature superconductors. As I said, uh, the theory, uh, their theory of high temperature superconductivity is not yet um, suggested. There are several theories on the market, but there is no agreement um, uh, among scientists which theory um, has better chance to be the theory of high temperature super superconductivity. And there are <coughs> some reasons for that. As I said it, uh, that for the prerequisites, um, what we know um, about cuprates, uh, the prerequisites say that there is general agreement that the pairing mechanism is not phonon mediated. Then it should be something else. So this um, is a plot of um, um, materials uh, versus years of discovery. So how the uh, development of material science in the search of uh, the new superconducting materials with the highest possible temperature of superconductivity uh, was done. And you see the breakthrough appeared in 1985 where uh, first lantanium system and then almost immediately uh, itium barium system was discovered and um, this itium barium copper oxide um, is uh, the um, material with a temperature of superconducting transition of 90 Kelvin and this is above liquid nitrogen um, uh, uh, temperature. So um, what then is known about this family of copper oxide materials? So first of all, uh, these materials are quasi two dimensional. You see that this is yttrium barium copper oxide elementary cell. It contains quite a lot of atoms um, in the elementary cell. Um, so you see uh, that uh, there is there are barium atoms, sorry, um, and yttrium atom. And then uh, these atoms are sandwiched um, between plane uh, containing uh, the so-called copper oxide uh, planes. So this is oxygen and this is copper. So uh, the first and very important observation was that the superconductivity, which is occurring um, in this quasi two dimensional materials, um, uh, because the superconductivity is mostly done um, in the planes. Uh, therefore, uh, this two dimensional or quasi two dimensional argument becomes uh, very important. I told you um, this week about Merman Wagner theorem, which tells uh, that um, the true long range order and superconductivity is related to long range order is impossible for low dimensional systems. In particular, it's impossible for two dimensional systems except temperature equal to zero. Therefore, when I'm saying quasi two dimensional, I still mean that there is a tunneling between different planes and the system is not truly uh, two dimensional. Otherwise, uh, one cannot apply mean field theory because fluctuations destroy the long range order. Um, so um, here, once again, uh, I plotted copper oxide plane. So you see it forms a sort of uh, square lattice. And this is a typical uh, cross section of the Fermi surface measured by angle resolved photo emission experiments. And what one sees uh, that um, the Fermi surface, when the system is doped, as I said, yet another important ingredient is that in stoichiometric metric situation, for example, when I'm talking about um, um, lantan copper oxide or yttrium barium copper oxide, uh, in stoichiometric configuration where um, it's yttrium barium two copper three or seven, the system is not superconducting. However, if you put addition oxygen into the system, it becomes superconducting. Um, so oxygen uh, is red. You see uh, that actually when I'm saying additional oxygen, I'm talking about holes. Basically you remove oxygen uh, from uh, the um, uh, lattice and therefore you create holes. So um, what then happens is that um, it's stoichiometric configuration, the system is so-called at F half filling. So the Fermi surface um, is perfect square. This is what is done by dashed line. Um, and um, this perfect square means that you have a congruent parts of the Fermi surface. You can get this line, shift it along uh, the direction one one, and you will um, arrive at the congruent part of the Fermi surface. 
because of this particular shape of the Fermi surface, any type of electron electron interaction uh, for the half filling will result in opening the gap. And the system is indeed insulating. And this is what was observed that in the stoichiometric uh, situation without doping, all these materials are insulators. However, if you dop a little bit, uh, then you create pockets, you create holes, and the system uh, becomes metallic, but this is so called pure metals. Mm. So this is bismuth based uh, copper oxide doped with strontium. So you see how complicated uh, the um, uh, elementary uh, cell is. And this is the way how RPES uh, is used to uh, measure. Uh, argument about quasi two dimensionality is very important. It's highly likely that by creating hole, you have sort of, um, can you hear me? Because I got a message that uh, the connection is unstable. Yeah, I think the connection is back now. I can hear you. Uh, we lost what you said in the past, um, maybe one minute. Okay, let me go back. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, bismuth-based copper oxide, uh, the same feature, copper oxide planes. However, this is the elementary cell. You see it contains uh, more than 20 atoms in elementary cell, and this is how angle result for the emission is used to uh, detect the shape of Fermi salts. So summarizing, I said uh, that all this observation actually were convincing for communities that this quasi-dimensionality has some important role in the uh, mechanism of high temperature superconductivity. The vicinity to metal insulated transition is very important. And the fact that um, uh, the holes are created in light and then the hopes uh, with a certain um, amplitude uh, is also uh, very, uh, very important. Moreover, the insulating state um, which occurs at stoichiometric configuration was found to be anti-ferromagnetic. So um, the spins are anti-parallel um, and therefore um, it was also important that creating holes, you somehow first need to destroy uh, the anti-magnetic uh, state. Now I'm coming to yet another important um, uh, discovery. So measuring uh, the Josephson contact um, between um, two different superconductors, it was found uh, that uh, the uh, energy gap has some nodes. It also resulted to uh, the fact that the specific heat, which actually produced exponential contribution um, at temperatures below a gap, um, and this exponent is associated with isotropic shape of the gap. So gap is uniform everywhere on the Fermi surface. For high temperature superconductors, it was not true. The specific heat was not exponential, which immediately resulted in the statement uh, that the gap is not uh, isotropic and moreover, it is equal to zero at some points on the Fermi surface. And these uh, points are called nodes of the gap. And then it was discovered that the gap has um, uh, D uh, symmetry. Um, so it's model, um, model um, equal to, uh, uh, to two. And therefore, um, one of uh, the uh, first suggestion, so these are D orbitals of the copper. These are P orbitals of the oxygen. Um, one of the suggestion was to um, apply so-called Hubbard model in order to describe uh, two-dimensional physics of the copper oxide uh, plane. Um, and then, um, uh, uh, people consider uh, the traveling on the whole on anti-ferromagnetic background, and therefore um, one of possible mechanism um, of high temperature superconductivity was suggested to be related to interaction of uh, the electrons with the um, uh, spin density waves uh, or uh, with magnons. Uh, uh, this is one uh, possibility. Uh, however, yet another possibility uh, and a very brilliant one. Um, so the, the first picture is the same BCS mechanism. Uh, however, instead of phonons, uh, one interacts with magnons. You see that the spin is flipped uh, 
um, uh, when uh, the um, electron travels, um, um, you see that it shifts and flips the spin, uh, and all the rest like is in BCS. However, Anderson suggested a completely different mechanism called uh, resonant equivalence bond or RVB. And let me explain briefly uh, what it is. Um, so um, uh, Anderson was inspired by uh, chemists. Uh, and in particular, this is a benzoyl ring. This are uh, high, high hydrocarbons. And in this benzoyl ring, uh, you know, the carbon valency is equal to four. So one of the valencies res resonating in the ring. It can be here or it can be there. So you see you have uh, three double uh, 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 connectors here, or you can have three double connectors there. And in chemistry, um, it actually depicted by putting ring here because uh, this um, bond is resonating between this and this uh, configuration. This is what was known for uh, almost 50 years um, in the quantum chemistry. And Anderson uh, suggested uh, that the same time uh, the um, bond is resonating in a singlet way uh, between uh, two um, uh, electron uh, state. And as a result, um, it forms a non-magnetic configuration, spin liquid configuration, which is attributed to um, uh, um, resonating bond. So the theory got a name of RVB or resonating valence bond. Um, and now I'm showing you, uh, let me see, it's, yeah, this is the last slide, how uh, complicated uh, the phase diagram of um, modern uh, high temperature superconductors is. As I said, uh, there are superconductors which are doped by hole. Namely, you remove oxygen uh, like yttrium barium copper oxide or lantanium copper oxide. And therefore, these are referred to hole type superconductors. And indeed, for very low concentration of uh, the carriers, the system remains insulating and antiferromagnetic. Uh, when you dope system more, then the superconducting dome is formed and there is optimal concentration corresponding to high possible uh, temperature of superconducting transition. So outside of the large dome, one has a Fermi liquid. Inside dome, there is a strong deviation from uh, the Fermi liquid behavior. Namely, resistivity, for example, is linear in temperature instead of being quadratic. So there is a strong um, indication of violation of uh, the Fermi liquid uh, paradigm. And there are many, many competing um, orders, uh, spin glass, um, pseudo gap regime. Uh, however, um, there are also electron doped uh, superconductors. Typically, these are superconductors based on cerium. So cerium doped uh, copper oxide, where um, one gets electrons as the carriers. And you see uh, that uh, the left-hand side of the diagram looks like as a caricature on the right-hand side. There is a still antiferromagnetic phase, but it overlaps with the superconductivity. So it leads to some coexistent phase. There is nothing bad with this, because we said in general that the singlet superconductivity uh, is unlikely to coexist with the ferromagnets because ferromagnets uh, create a net magnetization, uniform magnetization, as we have discussed. Um, and uh, this uniform magnetization acts as an upper critical field and leads to pair breaking effect. But for antiferromagnetic state, uh, there is um, no net magnetization, there is a staggered magnetization, and therefore there is nothing wrong um, about coexistence of superconductivity and magnetism. However, the superconducting dome is also formed, um, and uh, the temperature of superconducting transition for electron uh, type superconductors is lower compared to whole type, uh, type of superconductors. But as I said, there are um, features which are shared in both sides. Namely, uh, the superconductivity um, appears at finite concentration of the carriers. Superconductivity coexists or competes with the antiferromagnetic state. And uh, the transition occurs in the vicinity of metal insulated transition. As I said, people know it for now um, 35 uh, years. However, uh, the complete theory of high temperature superconductors is not yet created. So maybe you will be those who contribute to the theory of high temperature superconductivity 
if it will be part of your scientific interest and scientific career. This is all about superconductivity. Are there any questions? I have 25 more minutes to speak about magnetic systems and strongly correlated systems like heavy fermion compounds. Shall I switch to strongly correlated systems or you have some questions? To I have speak? a couple of questions, Professor. Okay. Yeah, uh, the first one was that I, I asked uh, about, I think I wrote it in the chat, uh, about the tau calculation. Uh, there's a scattering time, uh, which you showed earlier in the beginning of the slide. Uh, I know that they often th this is quite difficult to calculate and they often use uh, Boltzmann transport equations so the uh, non-equilibrium green function uh, method. Uh, I wanted to ask about the success in this. Is it uh, has it been um, is it easier now to calculate uh, the the tau uh, considering the impurity and electron uh, phonon interactions or no? Well, it's very good question. Thank you for asking. It's indeed a complicated uh, problem. I will talk about impurity in the second part of strongly correlated systems. Well, on one hand, one needs to solve a Boltzmann equation, right? Um, uh, however, if one um, actually relies upon certain model, um, like uh, intrinsically think about Drude conductivity or what, and do some simplification like one over tau approximation, which is very helpful um, in solving kinetic equation. Then of course, some um, calculations can, done be, can be done analytical. Um, of course, with only spherical shape of Fermi surface, uh, the calculation with realistical shape of Fermi surface can be done um, on a computer, uh, but it's indeed very complicated uh, problem because at the end of the day, you have integ integral differential equation. So your collision integral, uh, which is in the right-hand side of the kinetic equation is integral. The left-hand side is still differential equation. So um, to address your question, I would say uh, for simple model and for conventional um, materials and mechanism, uh, there is understanding on uh, what and how is going on. For a more complex system, I think um, research, uh, more detailed research is, is needed um, to do it. Um, oh, okay. Uh, uh, also, concerning organic, I, now I see yeah, you, yeah, because okay. um, it's yet another interesting question. I will uh, touch it. I don't know if I will have time to add that. Uh, you're right. Uh, so the idea about um, organic materials, I will speak about organic materials in strongly correlated system arose almost immediately uh, when people start to think about high temperature superconductors. The pioneers in uh, these ideas were Little um, and Ginsburg. Uh, they, for example, suggested that the organic molecules, long organic molecules can have so-called um, uh, charge transfer. Uh, so there is sort of exciton, which appears in these organic molecules uh, we discussed it um, in the course, in the first chapter of our course. The dielectric function is uh, the function of momentum and frequency. And for low frequency, very low frequencies, low than plasmonic frequency, the electric function becomes negative, which means that with a negative dielectric function, electron electron interaction in this range of frequencies becomes also attractive. Um, so, because of this attraction, um, uh, mediated by excitons, uh, some pairing can occur, and therefore people expected uh, that um, in organic materials, uh, the uh, superconductivity can actually be enhanced. However, uh, what I said is uh, something which is for superconductivity, what is against? Um, the known organic materials which are superconducting, so-called Beshgard salts, are quasi-one-dimensional materials. And in quasi-one-dimensional materials, um, the fluctuations are also strong. And as we know, the long range order is impossible in um, uh, one dimensional materials. Therefore, uh, the same type of physics which leads to uh, attraction uh, and enhancement of uh, electron and electron direction um, leads also to uh, growth uh, of the fluctuation and destruction of superconductivity by, uh, by fluctuations. But 
um, there are some examples of organic materials which are superconducting. I see. Uh, just one last question. I uh, I think that uh, within the quantum espresso package, uh, is uh, one can calculate uh, this with the uh, mid uh, midgal s back function, build back s back theory. Um, what can you say about the mid mid uh, midgal s back uh, theory compared to the dy dynamical mean field theory? How bad is it? Well, I. Uh, don't feel myself um, expert to answer a question. On Monday, uh, you will start the course with uh, Ralph Gebauer of electronic structure calculations. Ralph is one of the person who invented quantum expressor and wait until course of uh, Ralph Gebauer and ask your question to Ralph. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you. Um, more questions? Uh, Ian is asking about two dimensional systems. Uh, I thought that the, for two dimensional systems, the mean field cannot apply because fluctuation destroy. Uh, could you please explain more about this? In addition, I'm curious about the fluctuations in zero dimensional system. How can we investigate fluctuation in zero dimensional system? The second question is, of course, please explain in more detail the part of column interaction. Why not all materials are superconductors? So, uh, first of all, uh, mean field theory is not sensitive to dimensionality. When I derived this BCS equation, I uh, didn't make any assumption about whether I have three-dimensional, four-dimensional, or whatever. However, when we consider it a theory of phase transition, I told you that um, uh, you need to uh, add fluctuations to the system. And uh, for low dimensional systems, fluctuations become stronger and stronger. We discussed upper critical dimension for the theory lambda phi to the four, and we discovered that uh, four dimension is upper critical dimension. Namely, in dimension four, fluctuation leads to logarithmic correction of log tau. And logarithm is very slow function. For dimensions above four, the mean field theory becomes exact because corrections due to fluctuations go to zero. For dimensions below four, um, the fluctuations um, actually change physics um, in the very vicinity of the phase transition point. For three dimensional um, uh, system, the Ginzburg number for superconductors, which is TC to the Fermi energy is 10 to the power minus 12. For typical superconductors, which means we can approach uh, the critical temperature very, um, Close for two dimensional system, if we estimate the Ginzburg number, it's just TC of the Fermi energy. So it's, um, I would say, uh, eight orders of magnitude, which explains that the fluctuations in low dimension physics systems are stronger and stronger. Um, and as I said, uh, the theorem, the Merriman Wagner theorem, um, actually explicitly forbids long range order, including superconducting one for any temperatures. Uh, except temperature equal to zero. Uh, of course, for high TC, we have a quasi two dimensional situation. Uh, the um, uh, system is stabilized by tunneling of the electrons between planes. So it resolves the question um, of, of validity of uh, BCS, um, BCS theory. Um, however, uh, however, as I said, uh, in general, mean field uh, uh, description. Uh, is unlikely to be applicable uh, for two-dimensional system. It's not applicable for one-dimensional system. And for zero-dimensional system, I presume you mean something like quantum dots. It's of course very strongly fluctuating um, uh, system. However, uh, what I was referring uh, as fluctuation are mostly special fluctuations. I didn't speak about dynamical fluctuation. I was uh, talking about time independent Ginzburg Landau theory um, and the fluctuations um, associated to a special um, variation of your wave function. In zero dimensional uh, system, of course, uh, there is no space direction. So everything is related to time axis um, and um, the, the truth is, is the same. I mean, um, the fluctuations in uh, low dimensional systems are uh, strong to destroy any long range order. 
for the system without special exits, the only order which you can think about is time ordering, like what Professor Wilczyk uh, described in this uh, colloquium. Um, but this goes far beyond uh, the uh, topic of my lecture, and in particular, uh, the superconducting topic. And the last question about Coulomb interaction, I already explained. Um, uh, one needs to take into account electron phonon interaction and Coulomb interaction on equal footing, but electron phonon interaction is mostly relevant in the web narrow band um, um, in the vicinity of Fermi surface, and the width of this band is of the order of the by frequency. The Coulomb interaction um, is um, uh, spread in much wider band of the order of Fermi energy. Therefore, um, there is a log log logarithm renormalization. And this logarithm contains these two parameters. This is logarithm of the Fermi uh, energy uh, divided by the by frequency. Um, so if the Fermi energy of the order of 100,000 Kelvin and the by frequency of the order of 100 Kelvin, so uh, there are uh, three order of magnitude. There is logarithm of um, 1,000. Um, uh, which then divides um, divide uh, this uh, effective coupling constant, um, and you see that in general it can be sufficient um, to uh, find uh, that uh, the electron phonon coupling constant, being renormalized by Coulomb interaction, is still attractive. It's a matter of competition. However, it might also happen that after renormalization uh, you lose attraction at all, or attraction becomes extremely uh, small. And I remind you that the temperature is proportional to the exponent to the power minus one divided by effective coupling constant. If coupling constant is sufficiently small, uh, then the temperature of superconducting, whatever is in the predicate exponent, will be negligible. So this is actually explains that. As I said, I was very accurate in saying that in copper, the experiments were done up to milli Kelvin range and superconductivity was not found. But who knows if people, uh, we'll study superconductivity of copper, uh, which is diamagnetic metal at micro Kelvin, maybe some, some superconductivity will be discovered. But this is irrelevant from the point of view of applications. That's um, about electron photon interaction. Uh, uh, Rolanda asks about non-Fermi liquid, topological materials. Yeah. Twisted by layer graphene, correct. Um, <coughs> well, um, twisted by layer graphene and magic angles. Um, well, I didn't want to dwell into this topic um, because before coming to bilayer graphene, I probably need to explain to some of you what is graphene is. Um, um, however, um, indeed, this bilayer graphene um, is very interesting playground uh, for um, the a modeling, I mean, modeling an experiment of behavior of high temperature superconductors. So basically graphene is um, hexagonal structure of carbon. This is laid structure. One can put a uh, carbon uh, layer by layer and moreover, one can consider one layer of um, um, carbon plane. Uh, there are borocarbides um, um, and fluorides, um, but if to put two planes, uh, close to each other and a little bit uh, twist uh, one layer with respect to another one. Um, there is a magic angle of um, about one grade at which interesting physics appears. Uh, the interesting physics uh, of graphene is associated with the Dirac cones. This is why graphene, the spectrum, two-dimensional spectrum, has uh, some um, uh, nodes um, at uh, the uh, um, boundary of brilliant zone and uh, the spectrum in the vicinity of these nodes resembles relativistic uh, spectrum. This is why uh, graphene is frequently referred to uh, the uh, playground for relativistic physics like claim paradox, Zitter uh, Bewegung. However, if uh, one has a bilayer graphene um, uh, without twist, the spectrum is parabolic, uh, there are nodal points, but if one twisted, uh, there are so-called flat bands formed in um, this uh, twisted bilayer graphene. 
And the physics of flat bands results in the phase diagram, which can be measured by transport through this bilayer graphene structure, very close to uh, what people absorb in high temperature superconductors. Namely, the phase diagram is pretty the same, um, and so on and so forth. And indeed, uh, Rolanda is right. It looks like that the physics of strongly correlated systems and high temperature superconductors is closely related to non-Fermi liquid. I emphasized it several times. Having referred to these flat bands, it's closely related to change of topology, topology of Fermi surface um, in particular. Um, and these two phenomena seems to be very much interrelated. So uh, the non-Fermi liquid behavior and, uh, and uh, topology. And this is indeed a um, very hot topic now. There are many experimental group, in particular a group of uh, Pablo Herrera in MIT, group of David Galtaber Gordon um, in Stanford, um, uh, several group in uh, Europe, in Barcelona, a uh, um, uh, group of um, um, uh, Dmitry Yefetov, um, uh, so there, are, there are leading uh, groups um, in the world which are now um, start a race uh, for um, studying this bilayer graphene in connection uh, with ideal playground, highly controllable playground for understanding physics of strongly correlated system. And this is indeed very hot and interesting topic of modern uh, condensed metaphysics, both from the point of view of theory and from the point of view of experiment. Okay, so I have something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, there are many. Well, I mentioned only a few. So two years ago, when uh, before the COVID started, I attended uh, the big program in Aspen, um, in Colorado, um, where all leading groups um, actually sent. Um, were represented, so there were a lot of discussion um, about physics of bilayer graphene. Um, Pablo Herrera, who was the first person who invented this topic, gave a colloquium. We are thinking to invite Pablo uh, to present a colloquium at ICTP, so maybe if we manage to catch him, he's a great experimentalist, uh, very young person, um, uh, maybe you will have chance to um, listen to this colloquium at ICTP. Uh, and uh, address some questions uh, to him. Good. But I spoke with uh, Saro Fatso uh, about a collo colloquium of Professor Wilczyk. It looks like that I didn't participate in your discussion with Professor Wilczyk, but it looks like that you were unprepared. You know, when you have a chance to meet such a great person, and this is really um, enormous luck, it's better that you, first of all, do search in internet and read what Professor Welchik did. You prepare some questions in advance. Uh, and um, this makes things much more effective and efficient. And moreover, please remember that you are also representing ICTP. When you are talking to such great persons, um, his or her impression about ICTP will also be influenced by your behavior. So, so, so to say, you are also responsible for good image of ICTP. Please remember it when you talk to such great, great people. Um, yeah, that's um, okay. Um, I have a few more minutes. Maybe I quickly um, uh, go through the high, strongly correlated uh, systems. Uh, I deliberately started with a superconductivity. Um, can you see my slide with the strongly correlated systems? Do you see my slides? Yes, yes. yes Good. Quickly, heavy fermions. Um, because as I already mentioned, this high temperature superconductivity and heavy fermions are closely related. OK. Um, coming with the Frank Steglich observation, um, uh, which was done in 1970s, uh, there are several families of systems. Namely, one big family is based on cerium uh, 
based system, cerium kappa six, cerium kappa two, silicon two, cerium kappa indium five, cerium platinum bismuth, and so on and so forth. And there are uranium based system like uranium beryllium 13, uranium platinum three, which demonstrate very interesting behavior. Namely, there is T star, which was roughly uh, what was a Fermi energy before, and which is of the order of few Kelvin, a contrast to um, conventional metals where this energy is of the order of few hundred, few thousand or uh, 10,000 or even 100,000 Kelvin. Some of these systems are superconducting. Some of them are not superconducting. Some of them are demonstrating quantum phase transition. Um, some of them not. And some of them behave as a Fermi liquid and some of them not a Fermi liquid. Um, as we discussed it and you discussed it with Andre, um, by measuring specific heat of normal metal, one measures so-called Zomerfeld constant gamma. And the Zomerfeld constant is directly proportional to the effective mass. For conventional metals like alkali metal, lithium, uh, tungsten, sodium, uh, copper, gold, uh, silver, this effective mass and Fermi energy in electron world. The effective mass is of the order of effective mass of the electron as elementary particle. So by the way, uh, people measure both the cut the cut um, gives you a Zomerfeld coefficient. And if you measure the ratio of specific heat of a temperature is a function of temperature square, one simultaneously measures the phonon contribution, which is a slope of this curve. So this is how the specific heat C of a temperature is a function of temperature square uh, looks like for gold. So you see that both um, Zomerfeld constant and uh, phonon contribution is measured. Um, another possibility to measure effective mass is to do it through the gas van Alphen measurement. Uh, we consider it uh, the oscillations, well, sorry, we consider it the diamagnetism, the contribution to uh, the uh, magnetization uh, thanks to uh, the applied magnetic field, but it was a small magnetic field contribution. Uh, however, uh, at large magnetic field, um, one can see uh, there is also oscillatory contribution and um, this is the gas van Alphen effect. It is related to quantization of Landau levels. So, <coughs> and um, this oscillation occurs when the chemical potential cross the Landau level. Um, and this is the effective um, way uh, to measure the um, um, shape of the Fermi surface because effective mass is uh, related to the cross section so this is a sphere, you cross it with some plane. So you measure the effective mass or curvature, um, if you like. And what happens is that for both cerium-based and uranium-based um, uh, compounds, this effective mass deviates strongly from uh, the bare mass of electrons. So it's of the order of few hundred of the mass. This is why uh, the system are called heavy fermion compounds. Uh, there is a difference between cerium-based and uranium-based electrons. For cerium-based system, um, you have F shell of cerium, and there is one electrons, electron sitting on this F shell. This is inner shell. And um, this level is very far from the Fermi surface, which is hybridization of SP and D um, electrons. However, for uranium-based, um, the <coughs> physics is that the 5F level of uranium is very close to SPD uh, Fermi surface. Um, why it is important? Because in the first clay case, there is no hybridization of this level with uh, conduction electrons. And in this situation, there is. So one speaks about integer valency of cerium-based uh, uh, compounds and intermediate valency of uh, uranium-based heavy fermion compounds. So this is a system where the Fermi surface has very uh, complex topology. There are many pieces of the Fermi surface. And this is, for example, um, how, <coughs> how this uranium uh, beryllium-13 Fermi surface uh, looks uh, like. So let's start uh, with uh, um, cerium-based compounds. For example, cerium copper-2, silicon-2. There are many atoms in the crystalline lattice. And since the system is characterized by integer valency, 
people speak about so-called condo lattice. So the Hamiltonian describes conduction electron. This is a conduction band, this, this one. Then there are magnetic moments associated with the cerium, uh, this one, and they interact. And then of course, um, the magnetic moments interact through the Heisenberg um, interaction. The Hamiltonian, very simple Hamiltonian um, of uh, the um, uh, magnetic moments um, and uh, spins, interaction of magnetic moments and spins is referred as Conda Hamiltonian. Um, and the additional antiferromagnetic interaction can, for example, be uh, addressed by means of Ruderman Kittel Kasui Yesida interaction. Uh, because there is no direct overlap of the orbitals of cerium atoms. So you see that these atoms are quite distant. So now um, it's 12.30. Uh, please let me know if you can stay for, say, five, mostly 10 more minutes, or we finish now and I start answering question because you might have some other important things. And in principle, the time of lecture is over. Tell me, you prefer to stay, you prefer to finish, or you prefer something else? We have an exam at 2 p.m., so I think um, we need to take lunch and go back to Adriatico because the exam is at Adriatico guest house. Yeah. But what exam? Ah, yes, you have an uh, American, American yeah. exam. Okay, good. So therefore, let me, uh, having said that, let me, um, uh, because I already discussed organic superconductors. This is what I planned to show you. Uh, these are organic uh, superconductors um, and Beshgar salts. Um, we anyway have one or two meetings before exam. Um, I will therefore uh, finish now. Um, uh, we did discuss uh, the most important stuff of this lecture. I will probably use another 10 minutes during next meeting. Uh, and that's it. Probably at this moment, um, it's time to stop the recording because I want to show, uh, say a few organizational things. Uh, can you stop recording now? I don't know who is, uh, I will send the message. Well, professor, I think that there is still a question uh, in the chat from Lian saying again about the fluctuation in zero dimension. Could you please explain about the space independent mode of the wave function? Again, about the fluctuations in zero dimension. Explain about the space independent mode of, of the wave function. So, um, what is the. Um, image or picture for zero dimensional system. Um, uh, zero dimensional means, um, let's say you have sort of artificial atom um, or quantum dot. Quantum dot is island of two or three dimensional gas confined by electrostatic potential. This is what was done in quantum nanoelectronics uh, when such a system um, are prepared being a prototype of a single electron transistor quantum transistor, quantum diode. So as I said, um, uh, the system um, like an atom um, doesn't have special dimension or um, uh, all special dimension are small compared to uh, the dimensions of the leads attached to it. Um, um, so uh, this is what I uh, um, refer as zero dimensional uh, system. Um, uh, however, uh, what ca can one study with this zero dimensional uh, system? Um, definitely not phase transitions because for phase transition, one needs to have um, the thermodynamic limit. Namely, one needs to have a um, number of uh, states going to infinity and volume goes to infinity and the ratio um, uh, constant. So the phase transition question uh, cannot be addressed in this um, system. Thermodynamics probably too, because this system being quantum is characterized by energy levels. Um, 
and it contains few electrons. Um, again, there is no phase transition in the finite system. Um, uh, I explain it to you why, uh, because um, when we discuss the phase transition theory and I plot you this curve with two minimum, so landscape of potential of the free energy uh, function to the order parameter, <coughs> I told you about barrier which separates um, these two minima. For infinite system, the height of, well, the height of this barrier is proportional to the number of the atoms in the system. So therefore in the infinite system, the barrier is infinite and these two states are not connected. For the finite system, uh, the barrier is finite and therefore these two states are uh, connected and you cannot talk about uh, the phase transition in the finite system. One indeed needs to have a uh, thermodynamic limit in order to study phase transitions, including quantum phase transition. So uh, therefore what one can study through this um, zero dimension object is a quantum transport. Quantum transport means you um, push a current through the system, attaching uh, this zero dimensional object to the leads and putting uh, the source drain voltage, or you can um, attach this system to the slits at different temperature and therefore study heat transport, um, or um, one can study noise um, uh, in the system, uh, in particular short noise associated with the 